time to get off your sofa and do the mighty minute. Octopus make the whale laugh? I don't know. With his tentacles. <laughs> Why do bees have sticky hair? I don't know. Why do bees have sticky hair? Because of honeycombs. <laughs> bees go to hang out. I don't know, Ben. Where do monkeys go to hang out? In monkey bars. <laughs> What does a six foot budgie say? I don't know. What does a six foot budgie say? Cheat! Cheat! <laughs> what did one toilet say to the other toilet? I don't know. What did one toilet say to the other toilet? No, look a bit plus. <laughs> Why did Poppy throw butter out the window? I don't know. Why did Poppy throw the butter out of the window? Because she wanted to see the butterflies! <laughs> when is a door not a door? I don't know. When is a door not a door? When it's a door! <laughs> what do you do see on the seaside? I don't know. Beach. <laughs> do you have a joke? We really need your videos! Send them in to Mighty Mungos at saintmungos.org. We love seeing your faces. Here at Mighty Mungos, we are thankful. For gratitude, attitude. Let's see who sent in their videos this week. for evening walks. And I guess of pink stuff and pink flamingos. I'm thankful for spring and daffodils. So what are you thankful for? Send in your videos to mightymangos.org. We love seeing your faces. It's time for music. <laughs> <laughs> God said to us, the golden rivers love and so we love one 
The golden rule is love and so we love one another like he loved us God said to us The golden rule is love and so we love one another like he loves us We're gonna love, 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 love one another Oh, we're gonna love like him We're gonna love, 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 love one another Oh, we're gonna love like him We're gonna love, 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 love one another Oh, we're gonna love like him We're gonna love, 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 love one another Oh, we're gonna love like him Corinthians, Paul explains a lot about serving in the church. He uses analogies, using one thing 
to describe another. So he describes the church as the body of Christ, as he describes the different people in the church as different parts of the body. At first, that can sound a bit confusing, but bear with me. If anyone has seen Spy Kids, this image might come to mind. It doesn't really work, does it? Our bodies work best when we have eyes, ears, hands, feet. Paul says that church is like that too. He says we need teachers, worship leaders, tech guys, bakers, baby whisperers, setup teams, youth teams, administrative geniuses, people who can count, people who can pray, people with the gift of healing, prophets. That means that church needs you. What are your gifts? skills, talents, can you use them in church? If you can't use them yet, can you work on them? So that in time, you can. If you are brilliant with toddlers, could you sit and play with a little one after church while their mum chats? If you love to bake, could you make a cake for your parents' house group? If you're a whiz with editing, then get filming jokes and gratitude attitudes. If you're great at singing, then sing out loudly to help those of us who aren't. And watch this space, because there might be more opportunities to sing coming soon. If football is your passion, then find someone who wants to chat about the Premier League. Meet a church buddy for a kick around. Be an example of a good sport when you're playing at school. Paul makes it really clear that we're not all good at everything because that's not how God made us. He gave each of us different gifts and he asks us to use them in church. I could not lead church on my own. I can't sing. I definitely cannot operate the tech and you really don't want my cake. I can only be involved in serving church as a team alongside other people with different skills and there are other people reliant on me and the rest of the team running the kids groups because apparently some people find you lot mildly terrifying so not only does god give us the gifts to use in church making sure that between us we have it covered he actually tells us that we need to use them we are instructed to serve each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. That's in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Check it out and see if you agree with me. Now it's time for the Memory Verse Challenge! Do not give up meeting together, like some have done, but let's encourage each other. Hebrews 10, 25. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Please. Now our God will give you thanks and praise your glorious name. 1 Chronicles 29 13. Good morning and welcome to Mighty Mongo's news. This morning I've got two things to tell you about. The first is a suggestion. Maybe you've missed my suggestions in the last few weeks, but here's one for this week. I would like you every single day this week to pray for your teachers. Doesn't need to be a long prayer, doesn't need to use big, long, posh, fancy words. Just ask God to bless them. Pray for your teachers by name this week. And the second is to recommend a CD that's coming out. Now I know some of you might not even remember what a CD is, but plenty of you listen to them in your bedroom at bedtime or in the car. Anyway, our friends over at Worship For Everyone have put together their songs from the last two years 
into a CD. We've used loads of them with their permission on Mighty Mungos for Worship. I know that some of you have been singing along and watching them on YouTube. So maybe if you want to support Nick and Becky and their family, this would be a great thing to order now or to buy for a gift at Christmas. That's it. Our time together this morning is almost through. But before we go, there is, of course, just time for my favourite section, which is Family Face-Off. That's it, our time together at Mighty Mongoose has come to an end for another week. We can't wait to see you next week, but now there's going to be a short break. You can go off, you can grab a drink, you can go for a wee, you can oi, <laughs> grab a snack and join us back here at 10.30 for the next part of St Mungo's Church Online.
Well, good morning and welcome here to St. Mungo's Church this morning, whether you're here with us in person or if you're joining with us on the live stream, it's great to have you with us and to be able to come together as a church family again and worship God. My name is David Lyons. I'm one of the uh, members of staff here at St. Mungo's Church, and we are a church for people of all ages and situations in life. So whatever your circumstance, uh, no matter what you've done in your life or where you are at the moment, this here is family. We're family together, and you're so very welcome to be with us this morning. Uh, During our worship, we're going to have some song contemporary worship. We're going to have some prayers, uh, and we're going to have a a talk, a relevant talk from the Bible uh, from Ollie. But we're going to start our worship this morning by singing a hymn. So if you'd please stand and let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see It was grace that taught my heart That grace appeared The hour I first believed My chains are gone My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy Lord has promised. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion as long as life endures. My chains are gone. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me below, will be forever mine. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Please be seated. So we're going to continue our worship together by speaking out our liturgy. Now, what is liturgy? Well, essentially, it's a set of spoken declarations about who God is and what he's done for us. The words which have been used by Christians for for generations uh, and the rhythm and the repetitive nature of them helps me anyway to still the busyness in my mind uh, and put out the distractions and really focus in on God. 
And during this season, I think there's also great unity uh, when we do the liturgy together. So whether that we're here in person or whether we're at home, we can speak out these. I know that we're joining together uh, as the St. Mungo's Church family to proclaim these truths. As we finish, we're going to move straight into sung worship. So if you can just repeat the, the words that are underlined and bold underneath. O oh Lord, open our lips. Give us the joy of your saving help. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word and seek forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sin in penitence and faith. So let's say this sorry prayer together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's stand together as we, as we go into the next part. So blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive honor and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they have their being. You are worthy, O Lamb, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign with you on earth. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Coming on the clouds, he's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. Thank God he comes to save. He's here to set the captives free. 
Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the man. Every knee will bow before him. We will bow before you, God. Take our lives. Take our lives. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. The Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. You're so worthy, God. You're so worthy, God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love. is kind for all your goodness we will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find oh bless the Lord of oh, my soul oh my soul worship 
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years in there forevermore forevermore bless the Lord of my soul oh my soul worship his home
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the Thank you. 
things are possible. Jesus. And there's something about declaring the name of Jesus when we're here together aloud. We don't need to be silent anymore when we meet. So let's just declare out the name of Jesus over this place today. Declare the names that he is to you. Who is he to you? Provider, Savior, Jesus. Jesus, we enthrone you. We proclaim you are King. Standing here in the midst of us, we raise you up with our As we worship, build your throne. And as we worship, build your throne. And as we worship, build your throne. Come, Lord Jesus, and say. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you are in the midst of us, whether we're 
whether we're here, whether we're at home, we thank you you're not confined to buildings and places and spaces, but that you're Emmanuel, God with us, where we are. And Father, we want to, to have you at the center of our life in this moment here and as we go from here, whether we're at home and as we go from home, into our workplace, into our communities. We want to see the name of Jesus at the heart of all that we do. Do you come and fill us afresh with your spirit now? Let's come, Holy Spirit. Praise your name, Father. Amen. If you'd like to take your seats. I'm going to uh, invite Eric and Leslie to come up um, to the front here. Today is a very significant day. It's, uh, and Colin as well. Uh, it's Leslie's uh, official last day with us here at St. Mungo's. So it's uh, uh, some sadness on our part, but also a great excitement uh, we're really excited for what, uh, for what lies ahead, and I'm just going to hand over to Eric. Thank you, Dave. It struck me the, this morning that um, actually, since I became warden, quite a lot of key staff seem to have left. <laughs> but thankfully, some cracking folk have joined us, so I think that, that's pretty good too. Um, today, we say farewell um, to Colin and Leslie and Kirsty and Isla, as Leslie takes up her role um, as curate at St. Cuthbert's in Collington. <coughs> Leslie and Colin have, have played a major part in making St. Mungo's the place that we love, making it a place where we experience God's blessing on our lives. They've been part of St. Mungo's for 25, around 25 plus years, and have served and had leadership responsibility for most of that time. Colin has served an, on tech team, as a house group leader, and as, <laughs> and as a warden, together coming to almost 25 years of service. Thank you, Colin. Thank you too for attracting Leslie to St. Mungo's. <laughs> well, thank you for keeping her here then. Having been part of the, the worship team for a number of years, Leslie became worship director in 2002 and, and held that role for 11 years. And during that time, she was also worship director for Clan. But not only is she an anointed worship leader, she is an anointed teacher of God's word, bringing a combination of a love for God, a desire to live for God, and a distinctive perspective of her science, mind, and knowledge. I'm sure each of us will have some of her sermons stuck in our, our memory. One that stuck with me is a Sunday morning where with both grace and power, you gave a rousing rebuttal and a rousing counter to some of Richard Dawkins' um, teachings. That's stuck with me and it's stuck with our family as well. This morning I was also reminded as we were worshipping one Sunday evening when you were just about to lead worship and you turned to me and a few others and told us to take our hands out of our pockets. <laughs> <laughs> but you were dead right to do so. It's no surprise that you're taking a further step in using the blessings and the gifts that God has given you, the anointing that is on you as you become curate at St. Cuthbert's. And then, of course, we look forward to you taking up your own charge in due course. We are disappointed that we will no longer be directly receiving all the blessings of your worship and your instruction. But we thank you. We thank you both. We thank you as a family for 
And we are grateful to God for all that you have done to bless us here in St. Mungo's, the St. Mungo's family. May you as a family, may you, Leslie, know God's guidance, his blessing, and his protection as you take these steps of faith for him. We have some gifts for you to remind you of St. Mungo's. I'll do this one at a time or else this will go badly wrong. Thank you. I wasn't going to stop them because it was all deserved. <laughs> Testing. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a sad, it's sad. But can I just point out that I do plan to occasionally come back if I'm allowed through the doors. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hope to pop up for evening services and so on. So it's, it's a moving day today in many ways. But actually, mostly what I think I feel and we feel is gratitude and looking around. I mean, Alan Lindsay, when I came here, was what, Linda, Pete primary? Wee boy. Gav Cave still can't do the introductions to songs. <laughs> <laughs> These things will never change. And I look around at so many of you Sheila used to look after Kirsty to let me get to staff meetings. So many of our friends, those of you who've encouraged us, I have nothing but gratitude. And to Malcolm for the giftings, he's the one who taught me about the Holy Spirit. He's the one I learned how to preach from. And so I have so much gratitude to you all. And I think the words of that last song, that was probably one of my first songs in St. Mungo's, when I thought the worship was dreadfully emotional. Um, we, we want to see Jesus enthroned. And I'm going somewhere much more traditional. Some of you will walk in the doors and be slightly alarmed if you did. But we want to see Jesus enthroned. And worship is worship. And it takes thousands of forms across the world. And I suppose if there was one thing I could say is St. Mungo's, do not underestimate your influence in the Episcopal Church. Do not underestimate your influence in the church. And remember, the world needs the church more than ever at this point. And if we spend all our time focusing on our differences within the church, we cannot heal a broken world. So I, I love St. Mungo's, I love you all, I'm very grateful to you all, but I do plan to come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to make any speech apart from to say it was over 25 years ago when I came through the doors and Kenny, within about two weeks, roped me onto the PA team. And this is, this is the only way I've been able to get off the PA team is to leave. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, it's been an amazing journey, and Malcolm, if you're watching at home, thanks for everything. I was thinking if uh, one of my one of my favourite memories of Leslie is you always know when it's going to get really good is when she moves the lectern out the way. You know that the good stuff's on its way. But here it's gaffer taped. It's gaffer taped to the floor. So, uh, yes. There we go. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, as a senior team, uh, we've been taking some time just to consider 
uh, what we might, how we might meet as a church as we, as we move forward. And this morning, I just want to give you a, an update on where some of our, our thinking has got on that uh, and just invite you into the process of, of those proposals, which I'm going to outline in a moment. And what we're going to propose this morning is what we believe will be the best solution for how we can start to resume concurrent services in both Belerno and in Livingston. Because uh, this is a change which will impact you as a church family, we really feel that your voice is really significant uh, and we really want to hear it. So St. Mungo's is a word and spirit church and we want to make sure that we can allow both Livingston and Belerno to have live teaching on a Sunday morning. And historically, this would have happened by a preacher speaking in Bologna one week and then in Livingston the next. Or on occasion, we would live stream the talk from Bologna to Livingston or from Livingston to Bologna. And with the current teaching team uh, and a desire to invite some guest speakers, such as some of our, our, our mission partners, to get them up to come and speak, um, and the addition of live streaming our services, which we see uh, we'll think will be around for a while yet. Uh, this model is no longer feasible. So this morning, what we're going to present is what we think uh, is a, a possible solution, which will allow uh, the preacher to speak in both Livingston and Belerno on the same morning. So we're proposing to adjust the timings of our service by half an hour. So the Livingston service would start at 10 a.m., and the Belerno service would start at 11 a.m. And here's a graphic on the screen of how that would look. So the speaker would start the morning in Livingston, be in the service for the worship, uh, would speak, and then leave with the service leader continuing to lead that service in Livingston. The speaker would then arrive in Belerno in time for some of the worship, and then to deliver that same talk to the congregation in Belerno. The 8.45 is going to continue to be a really significant part of our Sunday morning uh, service schedule. And Ollie and myself will be leading this. Uh, and on weeks when Ollie is preaching, he'll speak at the 8.45, the Livingston and in Belerno. Uh, but on the other weeks, it just creates an opportunity uh, for us to be able to develop some new speakers. And one of the things that we absolutely love about our church is that we are a multi-generational family. And so we know that there are multiple ways in which this change will and might impact you, both positively and negatively. And so it's important that everyone who wishes to be able to give us some feedback on these proposals can do so. And so I'm just going to outline how we're going to go about doing that. So this afternoon, we're going to email out via Church Suite a copy of this proposal, what the solution is that we're, we're presenting to you, and what some of the implications might be. It's a, in the form of a paper which went to Vestry last week. And next Sunday, we're going to mention it again, and then we'll be putting out an online survey through SurveyMonkey to invite people to, to write back with your thoughts and your feedback. And then on Tuesday, the 5th of October... We're going to hold a one-hour Zoom call from 2 till 3 p.m., uh, and then again from 8 till 9 p.m., and then another Zoom call on Wednesday, the 6th of October, from 8 till 9 p.m. And on the, that call, Ollie will share some of his thoughts uh, and the vision about why we're proposing this, and then there's an opportunity to move into some breakout rooms uh, and discuss this with a member of the senior team or a member of Vestry. This is a house group week, so Tuesday the 5th and Wednesday the 6th are house group weeks, and so we're going to be asking all house groups uh, to attend one of these Zoom calls as opposed to meeting as a separate house group. Uh, and if you're not currently part of a house group, then you're really welcome to come and join whichever one of these calls suits you best. Once we've gathered that feedback, the senior team will take the rest of October to reflect and have a look at the feedback. And then we'll come back to you as a church in November uh, and talk about uh, how that proposal's gone and how we'll uh, plan to move ahead. Or if that dialogue that we've engaged in has in fact thrown up an alternative solution. 
So with this consultation taking place in October, it means that we're going to be remaining with our current model of meeting in alternate um, weeks as we move through um, October. Because currently, until we can find an alternative, uh, an alternative solution, uh, or the one that we're proposing, we can't run uh, both concurrent services in Livingston at Belerno at the moment. So we do recognize that this is a big change, uh, and we want to be able to do uh, church together. And I hope that actually is that as the preacher travels from Livingston through to Belerno, it creates this moment of unity and a connection across the congregations. It reminds us that we're still one church but in two locations, that we are still a multi-generational family with a heart to see kingdom transformation as we be love in the communities that we serve. I'm going to hand over to Ollie now for, for the talk, uh, but I think as he comes and gets ready, um, maybe you want to just turn and, and have a little chat with the person next to you about I don't know, something completely different uh, to, get your, to get your hearts and, and minds ready uh, as we head into, into the talk. Okay. Let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you that we can come as a church family to worship you in freedom. And we just remember our brothers and sisters in other places in the world who can't come in this freedom, who can't come together and worship the name of Jesus. And so we give you thanks for this amazing opportunity to be able to come together again as a family and to lift the name of Jesus up and to be in your presence. So come now as we continue our worship of you. We open our hearts to you and our minds to you. We ask you to speak and to feed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it just so happened that on the same day we're announcing a, a possible uh, a consultation where we're looking at possible changes of times of the morning services. The thing that I really felt the Lord lay in my heart for the passage we're looking at in John chapter 7 it's how we live out the timing of the Lord, the timing and the will of the Lord in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to be in the Gospels. Uh, I'm in the Gospels most of the time because I find it just helpful to keep on looking at the life of Jesus and seeing, is that how I'm living my life? Is that how I'm living my life? One of the things that makes John's Gospel stand out from any other Gospel is this emphasis that John has on the relationship between the Father and the Son. The word Father is mentioned more times in John than in the three other Gospels put together. And there's this incredible relationship between the Father and Jesus and him calling God the Father. And what we really see in John is that Jesus only did what his Father was doing. He did the Father's will and he did it in the Father's timing. After healing the paralyzed man back in John 5, Jesus says this, My Father is always at work, his work to this very day, and I am too working. Then he goes on to say to the religious leaders, Very truly I tell you, the Son could do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And we see this amazing just relationship, this utter dependence of Jesus on the Father to do his will and in the timing of the Father. Now, as we move through in the next two weeks in John chapter 7, we're going to see three things really kind of uh, stand out. Firstly, we're going to see a, a, deepening, a deepening hostility to Jesus by the religious leaders. We're actually going to see it grow. So it's not just the Pharisees, but it's going to be the Sanhedrin too. We're also going to see Jesus continuing to carry on the will of the Father in his timing. He's not going to back off as the persecution increases. And then we're going to see next week, Jesus teaches more about the Spirit. 
which I don't know about you, but that excites me to learn more about the Holy Spirit and how he lives in our lives and changes our lives. Now, as we head into John chapter 7, uh, some time has passed. So if you've got your Bibles, if you've got your apps, I'd encourage you to to open your Bibles. I'm not going to read through the passage, but I'm going to mention some verses within it. So I'd really encourage you to do that. But as we hit uh, chapter 7, there is probably about six months have passed. Jesus has been going around Galilee. We don't actually know what he's around. It just says this. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Now, it's probably a, a good th- uh, uh, an idea that he was just doing what he was doing. He was doing his father's will and his father's timing. He was healing the sick. He was, uh, he was casting out demons. He was showing people that he was the Messiah so that they could believe in him as the Son of God. So, so we don't really know what was happening, but that's probably a good suggestion. But what is completely clear is the deepening hostility of the Jewish leaders. John makes clear in, in, verse, in that verse that Jesus didn't want to go about in Judea, so he's still up in Galilee, he's still up in the north, he's still up in his home kind of territory, and it says he didn't want to go about in Judea, so he didn't want to come down to Jerusalem. Why? Because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. So here it is. The hostility has increased. And the words in Greek there actually implies an intensity for their searching for Jesus. They kept on seeking for a way to kill him. So it's not just, oh, they're now really going after him. And you can understand then why Jesus stays in Galilee, why he stays in that area. Even in light of this, Jesus doesn't stop doing what the Father's will is. But at the same time, he doesn't needlessly go and seek confrontation. Why? Because it's not the Father's timing. Jesus is not just doing the Father's will, but he's, he's doing it in the Father's timing. And that's what I really want us to focus on this morning. You know, as we read on and in, in verse 2, we see that Jesus' time in Galilee is just about at an end, as the Jewish festival of the tabernacles was near. Now, the festival of, of, of uh, this festival or feast was a thanksgiving for God's blessing in the harvest. That was one of the, the things they focused on. But another thing that they remembered and they longed for was the presence of God. What they, they looked back on was the, the presence of God in the tabernacle, in the tent, when they were in their wanderings. And Israel, the people of God, longed for the presence of God, just as we long. And there was this thought that um, during this festival, the Messiah would come again, the very presence of God. And they longed for this. It was like you, they got excited because there was this Jewish belief that the Messiah would come back during this festival. So it was a bit like, oh, you know, there was excitement in the crowd. They just didn't go, oh, yeah, it's another festival. But actually they were like, woo, is the Messiah going to come back? And you can see in verses 3 to 5, that's why Jesus' brothers were keen for him to go to Jerusalem. Let's look at that. It says this. This is what Jesus' brothers said to him. Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers and sisters did not believe in him. So this challenge to Jesus to go to Jerusalem was from his earthly brothers, his natural brothers, as in the sons born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus' birth. Now, the basis of their challenge is this, that if he was the Messiah, he needed to perform these signs. And it wasn't just in Galilee he needed to do it. He needed to do it in the holy city of Jerusalem, not in a remote place like Galilee. To minister in Galilee, in his brothers' minds, and probably in the wider leadership, was to act in secret. And that's why it says that they, he was act, they thought he was acting in secret. But Jesus is not interested in fulfilling the desires of man, but only the will of his Father in heaven and in the timing of his Father. Let's remember this challenge was coming from unbelief. It said there that his brothers didn't believe in him. And so this is why in verse 6, Jesus says, Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. For Jesus, it wasn't the right time for him to attend the festival and to teach the crowd because it wasn't the Father's time. Yes, Jesus would go at the right time, and we see that as we read on. 
But the time when his father said was the right time, when the opportunity was right for him to teach what the father wanted him to teach. And there's also the sense here in what Jesus says of the father's appointed time when he would go, you'd be arrested and go to the cross. So there's two kind of times being played out here. And this is probably what Jesus is referring to in verses 8 to 9 when he says, you go to the festival, as in saying to his brothers, you go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. And after he said this, he stayed in Galilee. But as we read on in this passage, we see very quickly, actually in verse 10, there's a however. And it says this, however, after his brothers had left the festival, he, Jesus, went also, not publicly, but in secret. So you can see there that Jesus, in a sense, was waiting for the timing of his father. And we'll unpack that a bit more. I want to pause here for a moment because I find the way Jesus lived his life, and I I love that. When we get into the Gospels, we really see that, don't we, on a day-to-day basis. I find that incredibly challenging to how I live my life. Jesus does not do his will. He doesn't just go, all right, I'm just going to go to the festival. I'm going to declare. Remember, this was a festival. They thought the Messiah would, would come in. He didn't go, yeah, I'm the Messiah. Here I am. That's it. No, he waited for his father's will and his father's timing. Now, when I was thinking about that, I started to think about the father's timing in my own life and the situations that I clearly saw the father move in and speak to. And I want to share a wee bit about that this morning. I find it really helpful. I want to share this morning a bit about how I live my life with God, with God the father. And I like to ask questions. I ask him specific questions in the sense of, should I do this now or should I wait? And I want to give you three examples of that, which we can then unpack, and hopefully that will help us to see how we live in the timing of the Lord. One of my favorite examples is when Laura and I had first got married, and we wanted to sell our flat so that we could move to a bigger place. I asked the father whether it was okay if we we could sell the flat, and I got this sense that we were to wait a year. I shared that with Laura, Laura, we prayed about it, and we felt that was right for that time. I thanked the father for, for answering, and we got on with life. Now, I'm not saying it was easy, because it's never easy waiting, especially for a whole year. Because after we got married, Laura moved into my man flat, okay, and we both felt a bit cramped. But we wanted to be obedient, so we waited for the year. Now, when the year was up, we felt it was okay to put the flat on the market. But five months went, and we still hadn't sold the flat. And it was coming up to that point, if you've sold your flat recently, that you need to renew your uh, your kind of fees to the SPC. It was during that time I asked the father for an update. (laughs) Oh, you have little faith. (gasps) I, say, I asked him, and he said, I am preparing a place for you. That's what I got. I am preparing a place for you. Now, the flat then sold within a month, and we didn't have to pay any more money, which was a really bless- great blessing. God acts never too early, but never too late. At that point, we had nowhere to stay, so we went and stayed with our parents. And at, f- uh, at first, nothing came on the market. It was a great time living with the in-laws, actually. Uh, getting meals cooked for you, lost your laundry done. It was, I didn't want to leave, I have to admit. But anyway, um, but we, there was just nothing on the market. And I started to think, have we got this right? And then houses started to appear, but each one that appeared had major problems. And then we nearly got one, but it fell through. And I can remember after leading an all-age service at Holy Trinity, coming home and going, just going, what is going on here? But something inside me just needed to declare the goodness of God in this situation. And so I just, we, we stood in, in the bedroom and I just declared the goodness of God over this whole situation. Later that afternoon, Laura found this new build on the website. It wasn't even on the, even on the SBC and she booked for me to go and see it. I said, oh, it's far too small. It'll never be the place, you know. The usual faith of a man, the usual faith of a woman. I went, and the minute I walked in, I knew this was the place. There was just a sense of God's presence, and everything that we had asked for was there. It was worth 
waiting the year. If we had tried to sell the flat before, we'd have never had the place. If, we, if the flat had sold instantly after the year, we'd have never had the place. God is so good and has good things for us. But sometimes we need to wait. And waiting is never easy. Now, before you start thinking too highly of me, I want to burst your bubble and tell you a story of what happens when you don't obey God and you don't a bit follow his timing. So after speaking, uh, after taking over clan youth, uh, I started to get quite a few speaking engagements here in Scotland. And that was great, and I really enjoyed it. But then one came to go abroad. I asked the father, should I go? I simply got the answer, no. I asked again, just to check. (laughs) And nothing came back. I have to admit that I had a greater desire to go and speak abroad than I had to be obedient to the Father. And what I can say is, is it didn't go well. In fact, it was the worst speaking trip I have ever been on. The Father says no for a reason. Because his timing is perfect and his will is good for us. But there also have been times in my life when I've asked the Father a specific question and I've got nothing. No sense, no word, just nothing. And it's in those times I've simply committed my way to God and then I've waited. Now the most recent time this happened to me in a major point in my life was after Kenny Borthwick had to retire on Granzerville Health at Holy Trinity. We had been a team, an amazing team for 10 years, and now it had ended. And I was left wondering what I was going to do. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I create a new role for myself in Holy Trinity? I asked friends, I asked family, and I got no sense whatsoever. All I had to do was pray and trust. Then a certain Reverend Malcolm Rand sent me an email asking if he could meet me. Now, the one thing I thought that I might do was to look for an evangelistic post because that's what I spent most of my time doing at Holy Trinity. When we met, all in secret, he asked me if I'd like to be the director of evangelism for St. Mungo's. Did I see that coming? No. But sometimes we simply need to pray and trust and allow the Father to bring his plan and his timing. Is that easy? It certainly isn't. Now, I want to unpack this a bit more and suggest some helpful ways, helpful things that we can do when we're, we're trying to live out the Father's timing, the Father's will, and maybe when we have no idea or we might have a slight inkling. So the first one is pray. We need to pray. One of the most helpful scriptures I find in all of this is Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. There's a promise there that as we submit to God, as we give our plans to him, he will make our path straight. It's his will that will come about. And I've seen that time and time again. We're simply lifting our prayers to the Father, asking him to make his will known and his timing known. And then often we trust and wait. So that's the first thing, we pray. But in the midst of waiting, often that's a really difficult time for us because we live in this instant culture when you you want a coffee and you get a coffee, you press a button and it just happens. Or, you know, you want this and you go onto Amazon uh, one click and you get it the next day. We live in an instant culture and we don't like to wait. But the Father often doesn't work like that. And so in this time of waiting, it's good to get into the word of God and just be fed by the word of God. God's word, as we've discovered, is is like bread and we need to feed off it every day. So pray, spend time in God's word, then spend time in God's presence, listening. It's really important to, to ask the Father specific questions and then listen. You know, I asked God the question when I was in, this, in the midst of this conversation with Malcolm, whether I, was, whether, whether I was released from the call that God had placed me in Holy Trinity. God had placed a very specific call, and he'd, I'd actually heard, felt I heard the audible voice of God in this. It was so direct. 
And so I needed to know if I was going to come to St. Mungo's, whether I was going to be released. And so I, I gave it to the Lord. I didn't hear anything. And then I, probably about three or four weeks later, I was standing shaving whilst I was, um, whilst I was on holiday. And all of a sudden, I wasn't even thinking about this. I heard the words, you are released. See, God loves to speak to his children, but we need to be ready to listen. You know, we've all got like amazing brothers and sisters here. And I'm so grateful for the people God has placed in my life that when I need guidance, I go to them. When I need prayer, I ask them. And in a time when we might not know what God's timing is or what will, God's will is, it's good to ask people to pray for you. Because often they see things and they hear things that we might not. The next one is, do we push doors? Do we go active or we do go passive? And this is probably the hardest one. Because, you know, sometimes we find it so difficult to wait. Oh, we'll just start pushing the doors. You know, I often find when I get a, I get a thought, okay, I'll go and talk to this person, or I'll push this door. What I pray is this. If this is not your will, Father, then shut the door. But if it is, then don't allow anyone to shut it. Sometimes we need to push the doors, but sometimes we need to wait. And then that's the last one. We need to be prepared to wait. But knowing in the waiting that God is good, and he has good things for us. There are so many promises attached to the scriptures about waiting on the Lord. Waiting is an opportunity to build trust. It's actually an opportunity to see God's goodness and faithfulness in our lives. Well, I hope those suggestions have been helpful. But the most important thing I want you to remember is that God's will and timing is perfect. Is it easy to wait? No, it's not. But he has good things for us. And as we continue to pray and give things over to God, his promise is that he will make up our strength. So let's wrap up by getting back to Jesus. He ignores his brothers, but yet he goes at the right time, the timing of the Father. It says this in verse 14, not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. We're not told what Jesus taught, but in verse 15 it says, the Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Now remember, some of the Jews there wouldn't have ever heard Jesus teach because they were coming from all areas to this feast. But what we know is that they were amazed by his knowledge of the scripture and that he hadn't been um, educated by a rabbi. But the question I was thinking about uh, while reading this, the rest of this encounter, which, which takes place halfway through the festival, was why did the father want Jesus to go then? Why not at the beginning? This is the first of two encounters that Jesus has at this festival. We're going to look at the second one. But why now? What did the Father want Jesus to convey to the people, to the leaders in that moment? Well, as I read, I started to see the reason for Jesus going to that festival at this point. And that was to show the Father's heart. To show the Father's heart. Let's look at verse 21. Here, there's a, a mention of a miracle, and this is the miracle when Jesus healed the paralyzed man. It says this, I did one miracle, and you're amazed, yeah, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcised a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. The Pharisees were just looking at the outward appearance. Jesus came to show us the Father's heart by healing the man on the Sabbath. The, the Pharisees were hiding behind what they call the Mishnah, the 1,500 laws that they put around the Sabbath to protect it. But they actually weighed people down and stopped the Father from doing, or stopped them from doing what the Father was doing. We see that. Why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? And then he says this at the end, stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. See, Jesus knew the Father's heart. He was in the Father's will and in the Father's timing. And so he knew that that man needed to be healed that day on the Sabbath. And that was just a reflection of the Father's heart. But what did the Pharisees do? They looked to persecute not just the man, but Jesus also. 
You know, I find it really challenging to think about this. Just to look at the way Jesus lived. When he healed that man, that was the right time for that man. Why did he just heal him? I don't know. But that was God's will. Do we often look at people and think, ah, oh, nah, you're far too far gone? Do we let that outward appearance stop us from sharing the gospel? Or do we do what the Father wants, and that's to show mercy? You see, the Pharisees had, had wanted sacrifice, but they'd forgotten that the Father desired mercy, as it says in the scriptures. I want to finish off by telling you just a quick story. During the summer, we used to run a holiday club in Wester Hills. And I remember going to the uh, school gate purposely to hand out the leaflets to the mums to invite their kids to the holiday club. And it was all going well. I was having some good chats. And all of a sudden, I heard, All right, Ollie! All right, man! How are you doing? I was like, no. <laughs> this is not the right moment. And I looked and I saw this guy who I used to work with as a as a kid, and I was just like, everything inside me just wanted him to disappear. And you could see the mums just go, Phew. I was like, oh. I had this friend with me who's just an amazing man of God. He's an amazing evangelist. And this guy came up, all right, Ollie, how you doing? And I was just like, oh, man. And I looked at him, and I judged him by his appearance. I just wanted him to go. But my friend started to tell him about Jesus. My friend told him that God loved him. My friend told him the gospel, how Jesus had died for him. And we had this amazing conversation with this guy. See, the Pharisees were judging by appearance. Oh, he's a sinner. That's why he's sick. That's why Jesus came to show the Father's heart. At the right time, the Father's will was done. Do we often look at people if we're honest and say, nah, I'm not going to speak to them. I've had some crazy adventures where I've just sought the Father's will. And the Father's brought people in my way. And God's done amazing things. Are we just too risk averse? Are we too comfortable? Do we just look at the outward appearance and say, nah, not See, Jesus came at this time, I believe, to wake the people up, to wake the teachers up and say, you need to stop judging and start revealing the heart of the Father. And in me, you see that. That's my desire. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that when we were still far off, you didn't say to us, you need to clean yourself up. You didn't say to us, oh, see that. You're not coming anywhere close to me before you get that sorted. But you sent your son Jesus into this world to show us mercy, to show us grace, to break the chains so that we could live in your love and be love as we abide in you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to challenge us how we live our lives to live in the Father's will, to live in the Father's timing so that we can be love to those around us. We can be love to those that you put in front of us. Lord, forgive us. I, I say this, I stand here and I ask your forgiveness when I have judged by outward appearance. Lord, would you revive our hearts? Would you break our hearts for what break yours? We've sung it, Lord, Lord, that's my desire. I wonder in response if that's your desire, that the Father would break your heart for what breaks his this morning. I wonder if you just put your hands out to respond, just to say, Father, I don't want to judge how the world judges, but I want, to, I, I want to look at what matters to you. Just come, Holy Spirit. Break our hearts for what breaks yours.
that we may see your kingdom come in people's lives. Do your work in us, we pray. Give us a new sight to see people how you see them. And that many would come into the kingdom through us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to go back into worship. Sorry, I don't have the song sheet, so I don't know what song it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why don't we just stand and let's just use this song as a response. Just... I was singing a song in the car which just said, I'm available. I'm available to you, Jesus, this week. And the presence of God hit the car. And I was reminded of who I was saying I was available to. Not just some leader, not just some king, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it was like, it was something of the majesty of God and the glory of God hit me. And I realized what a wonderful, wonderful thing it is that we can be servants of the Most High God, that we can do His bidding in our lives, that we can do His will in His timing and in His way. Father, thank you for the beautiful call that you've placed on each of our lives to be love, to be Jesus, to be light of the world. And as we respond now, Lord, we just give our hearts to you afresh. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More of you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing.
I will build my life. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, Jesus. Yeah, Father, we, we thank you that you kept your promise, and in your perfect timing, you sent Jesus to die on a cross and to open up a new way of life that we could have life in all its fullness. And we ask you, Lord, just to bless us with that life so that we can make a difference in this world for you. Father, we pray for Leslie. Lord, we thank you for her. And we just ask your blessing upon her as she goes, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the influence that she already has. And we pray, Lord, you would increase that Thank you that we are in the Episcopal Church. Help us to remember to pray for the church. Father, we need your blessing as we go because we cannot do what you call us to do without you. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, would you come and fill us afresh? And now may the blessing of the Father who adores you, the Son who calls you to walk alongside him, and the Holy Spirit, who empowers you to do everything that we're called to do. And now may the blessed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much to the band, to the tech team. Thank you also to... um, Please, when you go out, please thank the volunteers leading the Note 18. They're just doing an amazing job, and we're very blessed to have them. Thank you, everyone. We realize big news today, so please do away. The proposal will come out by email. Thanks today for just laying that out so well. This is a consultation. We want to hear what, what you hear. This is not just, uh, I say, you know, this is not an Ember City Council consultation. This is us wanting us to hear. <laughs> Sorry if you weren't for every state council. I probably just like, alienated myself. But... We, we, we want this, you know, we're a church family, and we, we want to be a blessing. So just put that out. Bless you. Have a great week.